for set. So. We met at nine. We met at eight. I was on time. No, you were late. Ah, yes? I remember it well. We dined with friends. We dined alone. A tenor sang. A baritone. Ah, yes. I remember it well. That dazzling April moon. There was none that night. And the month was June. That's right. That's right. It warms my heart to know that you remember still the way you do. Ah, yes. I remember it well. So I was just, oops. So yesterday we talked sort of about a broad overview of the history of the psychology of learning and memory. And today we're going to focus on one particular type of memory, which is sort of episodic and semantic memory. It's also known as declarative memory. And I'm going to talk, as I'm going to talk, there'll be three parts to the talk. Begin by discussing behavioral processes and go through a number of key issues. Then talk about brain substrates. Today we'll get more into the neuroscience. And finally end with some clinical perspectives. So most people in, in psychology are aware of the case of, of HM who uh, just died a few years ago and now is uh, known as uh, Henry Molaison, his true name. Uh, when he was 27 years old in 1953, he had surgery to treat severe epilepsy. And epileptic seizures originate uh, often in the medial temporal lobe in the hippocampus. And they took out both sides of his medial temporal lobe. Um, and you can see here some of uh, what the damage was. And uh, this was necessary because the seizures were getting ever worse. And if they had continued, they would have killed him. So it was really sort of a life-saving surgery, given what the technology was at the time. Um, but the cost was that he had tremendous anterograde amnesia. And so by anterograde amnesia, we mean the ability to form new memories, as opposed to retrograde amnesia, which is the loss of memories in the past. So everything up until 1953, when he was 27, um, was still intact. Beyond that, he couldn't form new memories, very much like Clive Wearing. Who, who we saw a bit of the video um, earlier this week about his sort of life and his wife. Um, he could meet a new doctor, complete hours of testings, and then not recognize the doctor the next day. Um, he also could not grieve for anybody, because I think about the process of grieving is coming to sort of recognize, remember that someone is gone, and integrate that into your new view of the world. Without the ability to form new memories, he would constantly um, uh, go through the grieving process every time he learned that someone had died. Um, most of his memories before the surgery were still intact, his parents' names, his childhood home, he could remember things as long as he was attending to them, so they were still in his working active memory. Um, he could remember it, saying it over and over again and dial it, but as soon as he was distracted, he would forget it. Okay. He was the first clear demonstration that memory is actually a system of brain functions that can be dissociated. Um, as I said, he could still work with new information, so he had an intact working memory system. Um, he could still remember long-term information, his childhood, everything else. So what was missing was the ability to go from one to the other. And it suggested that the medial temporal lobes were critical for the consolidation of memory from working memory, often called short-term memory, to long-term memory. The psychologist Brenda Milner, who studied him for many years, discovered that HM could form some types of lasting memories. These were memories of procedures, learning to trace objects while looking in a mirror, it's a particular skill, skills like playing backgammon. All this was done without conscious awareness. He did, he did not recall the learning of this, but he just suddenly felt like this was something he knew. So HM also gave psychologists and, and, and neuroscientists the uh, realization that there were two different types of memories those which depended on this hippocampal dependent consolidation from working memory to declarative, explicit long-term memory, but another set of memories or skills and learning that didn't depend, that's often referred to as non-declarative or skill learning. So this multiple memory systems model is the predominant model um, that has guided our attempts to understand the neuroscience of human memory. Uh, the key difference between the skill memories like tying your shoe, 
or learning to write backwards in a mirror, and memory for events and fact are three. Skill memory is difficult to convey to others. If I asked you, how do you tie your shoe? Describe it to me, you know, by a list of rules. You'd probably be really hard put, although you can bend down and tie your shoe almost well without paying attention. Memory for events, in fact, can be communicated very flexibly and easily. Skill memory can be acquired without awareness. Um, the uh, memory for events and facts has contents that's generally consciously available. Skill memory often requires several repetitions. You know, a small child needs to be trained many, many times to tie their shoe before they get it right. Um, memory for an event has to be acquired in one particular moment because that event only happens once. So what type of memory is, is how to ride a bike? It's an easy one. Yeah. Skill. Right? So non-declarative or implicit, also skill. Remembering the first time you rode a bike, that's declarative or explicit. Remembering who is the current president of the United States? Right, that's declarative and that's explicit. So this distinguishes the difference between episodic, which is an, of an event, versus a semantic, which is knowledge about the world. So let's talk a bit about episodic and semantic memory. Declarative memories are broken down into two types. Episodic, a memory for a specific autobiographical event, your first kiss. Semantic, memories for facts and general knowledge, such as your mother's name. Here's a broad, we, we pretty much just went through all of this. Um, they, uh, um, I'm sorry, we went before we talked about the differences between declarative memories and implicit memories. Now we'll talk about the differences between episodic memory and semantic memory. Both can be communicated flexibly, okay? Um, an episodic memory is often I remember, I remember my first kiss. Fact is I know my mother's name. Both can be communicated flexibly, both are consciously accessible. Episodic memory is tagged with a spatial and temporal context. Semantic memory, not necessarily so. Episodic memory, by its very nature, is autobiographical. Semantic could be personal or general information. Episodic memory is learned in a single exposure, and it can also be weakened by exposure to similar events. Okay? So, for example, an episodic memory is where I parked my car in the Costco parking lot uh, this morning before I went shopping, but I may have been there many, many times in the past, and so it's weakened. My memory for, for parking in the parking lot this time may be weakened by the many other times I've parked in the parking lot and I get confused. Semantic memory can also be learned in a single exposure. Okay? If I tell you a certain fact, um, then uh, you can learn that at one time, but it can also be strengthened by repetition. Okay? Both are forms of declarative memory. HM could not form either. Okay? So remembering how you got to class today, is that episodic or semantic? Remembering your address, semantic. Okay. So again, sort of just thinking about them, uh, episodic memory is easy to communicate. Where your graduation took place, who's the first president is semantic memory. Again, how to tie a shoelace is not so easy to communicate. You'll learn episodic memory always once. Semantic memory can be once or more. Declarative, mem non-declarative memories almost always involve many, many trials, but not necessarily. Um, they're consciously accessible for both types, episodic and semantic. But do you know which hand you use to start tying your shoe? Probably not. You probably have to actually almost go down physically or, or mentally rehearse it. Okay? So it's often not consciously accessible how it is you do these things. So. Because so much of episodic and semantic memory, when we assess it in humans, is based on language and ability to communicate, one of the questions is, what is, it, is it meaningful to talk about animals, non-human animals, having episodic and semantic memory? Um, one of the ways in which this has been done is to look at, the, at least for episodic, the notion of a spatial and temporal tag. So in rat radial arm mazes, food is placed in a specific food arm. The rat starts from a specific arm. After training, the rat is started from a new arm, but navigates directly to the food arm. This demonstrates a flexible use of memory. Okay, so it's a hallmark, I'm sorry, of semantic memory. So the idea is that when we're talking about animals, um, so the animal has this sort of this knowledge which is flexible in the sense that it's not just a skill how to get there, but it's a knowledge. Um, whether or not this is exactly the same as knowing George Washington's name, 
you know, it's not an identical. One of the nicest demonstrations of episodic memory that does uh, an animal um, understand a specific event are scrub jays tend to bury both worms and nuts in these sand-filled cubes. Um, then uh, they much prefer their favorite food is worms. So once they've buried them, if you bring them back a few hours later, um, they, will, uh, they will go for the worms. But if you bring them back 124 hours, they tend to choose the still edible nuts because they know that the worms, which are their favorite food, are going to have decayed and rotted by then. So it suggests an ability to recall specific details of what was buried, whether or not that's episodic memory, you know, is sort of questionable. So it's, it's, there's been sort of a challenge to develop animal analogs of episodic and semantic memory. Um, when we think about memories, um, there are two main parts of the process that we want to think about, the encoding and the retrieving. Let's talk first about encoding. So here we are observing a, a burglar. Okay, the memory has to get, you observe it, memory gets encoded here in the brain. That's the initial storage into memory. Okay, sometime later you have a memory of seeing this burglar break into a safe and now you, you consolidate it, okay, you make it sort of permanent, so it's maintaining it. And then you retrieve it when it comes time to come to the eyewitness stand, to be an eyewitness to a burglary and pick out the, uh, the burglar that you saw. So the idea is there's encoding, the storage and the consolidation and retrieval, sort of the loop of, in this case, an episodic memory. Okay. So let's focus first on the encoding and the initial storage into memory. What do we know about that? So mere exposure isn't enough. So let me ask, here are 10 different pictures of pennies. Which of these is actually the real U.S. penny? Okay. But people are not generally that accurate, although we've seen for all your life you've been seeing pennies you know, all the time. But even though you've seen them, that hasn't helped you learn the visual details, in part because you don't really need to process that detail. You know the size, you see the color, you know generally that Lincoln is there. Um, but you don't need to process it at that level. So just being exposed to something isn't enough. Just sort of rereading the notes in a book is not enough for studying for a final. You know, just because you've gone through it, it can be just like looking at pennies all your life. You may not actually get the, the details that you need. So let me first read you a phrase and ask you what you think of it, uh, to, th to remember it. If the balloons popped, the sound wouldn't be able to carry since everything would be too far away from the correct floor. So imagine I give you that phrase and I ask you an hour, a day later to repeat it. Um, you would have some level of accuracy, often not very high, because this sentence just seems somewhat nonsensical. Okay? It doesn't make an obvious sense. But if I show you this picture, it shows you a man serenading his sweetheart on the top floor of an apartment building with the speakers being held up by the balloon. And you've seen this picture. And then I, then I read you the phrase, if the balloons popped, the sound wouldn't be able to carry since everything would be too far away from the correct floor. Okay? Now that you've seen this, this image, this phrase makes a lot more sense. And in fact, if I show you this image first, you'll vastly increase your ability to retain that sentence. And so what that tells us, what, what, that, what that exemplifies is the fact that prior knowledge helps. And it's actually one of the reasons why, although lots of aspects of memory decay with aging and get worse. Some aspects get better. And part of the reason is as you get older, you have a greater and greater storehouse of prior knowledge. So although the, the sort of the raw firepower of your brain for memory may have declined, you have so many more things that you can use to interpret, to understand, and connect up new information that it's often easier when you're older and hopefully more knowledgeable um, to learn new things. So this just shows, this is sort of the percent recall with no picture, picture before the story, and picture after the story. So the idea is that what's most helpful is to have this prior knowledge, in this case of what this image is, to help you recall the details, to sort of tie it in. So the study tip, read before class, okay? Reading afterwards is not as effective, because if you sort of read before class, you get enough of a, a general understanding of an area 
that when the lecture comes and the details come, you can sort of put it into context. I know you guys are all looking a little no, skeptical. We don't get the lectures before. <laughs> right, okay. Well, there's textbook. There's the well, some of them are not even. Well, now that we've attended lecture, we have better schema for what we're reading. That's true. So let's talk about depth of, of processing. So Craig and Tolving proposed that the more deeply you process information, the better it's encoding. So a classic study had you memorize lists of words with three different depths of processing. So one was just to pronounce it. I give you something you have to pronounce it. That's sort of the lowest level. It's really just the superficial characteristics of the word. Then I have you imi um, uh, image it, sort of a mat to take the word and imagine it, okay? Um, which is sort of a higher level processing because you have to go into the semantics and the meaning, dredge up what you know about its physical appearance, and create a mental image. So not surprising, words that are imaged are remembered much more than words that are pronounced. And we'll come back to this experiment later on in the lecture and talk about some brain studies that have been done that use the same paradigm to look at the brain substrates of encoding. So, oh, I'm sorry, here it is. We'll just skip over that, we'll come back to that later. Um, let's talk about uh, retrieving memories. So, back here we talked about, you, rec you see the, the crime occurring, you store it, then you have to retrieve it to match it against the, uh, the people in the lineup, okay? So one of the things that has been found is that retrieval is, very, tra is uh, very sensitive to the context in which it occurs relative to the context in which the encoding occurs. So a classic study is participants learned two lists of words, one they learned on land and one they learned underwater while they were doing scuba training. And subjects were then tested in the same context, so land tested on land, scuba tested on scuba, or different context, and the same context group perform performed uh, much better. So one interpretation of that is retrieval works better when the context is the same. So a study tip is study the same way you'll be tested. You could also study in the same room that you'll be tested, perhaps. Um, what will be the downside of studying in the same room in which you'll be tested? As far as getting a good grade of the test is concerned? Just in general. In general. Knowledge might be less portable. Exactly. So the point is um, that if you only Get, if, you only, if you only study and get tested in one context, you risk that that, that, that uh, learning becomes very context-bound. Um, it may not affect your grade on the exam, but it might affect your ability to apply that. Um, pianists, who, unlike violinists who carry their own violin from performance to performance, vi uh, pianists generally don't carry their own pi piano and they have to use the local piano. And so pianists very often specifically find several pianos to practice on so that they don't become so bound to the particular context in which they're learning, so that they can then not be flustered when they go to a new concert hall with a new piano. Another example of sort of context-dependent memory was this cartoon that says, I wonder if you'd mind giving me directions. I've never been sober in this part of town before. Um, uh, this actually uh, relates to a real study that was done where it looked at people who were studied sober or drunk and tested sober or drunk and the good news is that the best thing to do is to study sober and take your test sober, in case any of you were thinking of something else. However, if you know you're going to be drunk when you come to the exam, it actually is better to be a little drunk when you do your studying because the internal context uh, provides a retrieval cue. So the other aspect of retrieval has to do with the number of cues. So there are a number of ways that we can test your memory. A memory test could be a recognition test you know, a question response with options. It's like the multiple choice. Um, a cued question where I give you a question with maybe a little bit of a prompt and a total free recall with a question alone. So on the final exam, which of these would you rather have? Recognition, which is basically multiple choice, cued recall, or total free recall? What? I'd like to have multiple choice because it gives you the most clues, okay? So the more cues, okay, there are, and the difficulty. So, as an example, what, what, form of mem what, what, what form of memory is for facts and general knowledge? Okay. Now, that would have been a little easier if I gave you a hint. Okay. Or even easier if I said which of these four is the answer. Okay, this was an easy question, but you can certainly see how the easier. What? Four next. Well, that was just the... Okay, so now I would like to if you take out a piece of paper. Okay, those, those of you who didn't grow up on Disney are excused. Okay, write down as many of the seven d Disney dwarfs as you can remember. 
Okay. As many of the seven dwarfs as you can remember. Okay. So how many how many can you remember? One. One. Five. Wow. So, somebody had a a, a a fun childhood being taken to Disneyland. <laughs> Okay. So how many how many did you guys get? Okay. So an alternative would be to ask you which of these which of these are our seven dwarfs? Grouchy? No. Gabby? Fearful? Sleepy? Yeah. Smiley? No. Grumpy? Yeah. Yeah. Hopeful? No. Dumpy? No. Wishful? Puffy? Dumpy? Sneezy? Yeah. Slazy? Pop? Bashful? Silly? Wheezy? Shy? Cheerful? Droopy? Teach? I don't know what that is. Hapless? Happy? Goofy, sniffy, doc, dreamy, nifty, dopey. That's my one. Which is your one? Dopey. 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 Okay. I miss grumpy and doc. Okay. So it actually it's sleepy, grumpy, sneezy, bashful, happy, doc, and dopey. So, again, you can see that sort of having having options, having more information, having clues helps much more than trying to generate it. So free recall. The terms that are used here are free recall is to generate the response from memory. Cued recall is a prompt given to facilitate response generation. Recognition is to identify the target from distractor items. So one of the things that's most uh, uh, fascinating but also most uh, aggravating about memory is the many ways in which it fails us when we want to rely on it. So. Memory failure can occur in any point in the cycle, from the encoding, to the storage and consolidation, to the retrieval. Okay. Some for, for various problems occur are forgetting information, interference, misattribution, and false memory. And I will talk a little bit about these different ways in which memory fails. So uh, a study was done that took advantage of the fact that most, many TV shows only, only last for one season. So if you didn't catch them in 19-whatever, you missed it. And so the researchers collected all these one-season TV shows um, and then uh, looked for people's ability to sort of remember the shows. And what they found is that there's sort of, just sort of an overall decline, sort of like Ebbinghaus, like the Ebbinghaus study, but done over the course of 15 years. So we tend to sort of, as time goes on, we tend to forget information. Um, Memory failure can also happen from overlapping information that can interfere with memory, producing storage and retrieval errors. There are two types of interference that you should be able to distinguish. Proactive information, proactive interference, where old information interferes with new information. So that would be keeping your old number even though you've moved. Okay. So you keep using your old number even though you've used. Um, I had the same problem when I first moved here from Stanford. Um, my office here is on the second floor. My office at Stanford was on the third floor. I kept coming into the elevator and pressing three because for many years when I got to work, pressing three on the elevator button was how I got to my office. So that's an example of proactive interference. Old information interferes with new information. Retroactive information interference is when new interfer information interferes with old information. So actually after you finally learn the new number, okay, it's hard to remember the old one. Or I would go back to Stanford and have trouble finding my advisor's lab because I sort of got it next up with where I, my lab was now. So really important to understand and be able to use these terms, proactive interference and retroactive interference. Okay? The way these are often studied is in the following. You st with list studies, so you list a whole bunch of lists that associate various words, dog, chair, ax, snow, and you learn these lists so that if you're given the first word, you can generate the second. These are called paired associate. Okay. Um, and then you learn a second list, dog, window, and so forth. And you'll notice that dog is an antecedent in both of them. Okay. So proactive interference okay, is I tell you to recall list two, and you do dog. What would an example of proactive interference be here? Right, okay. okay. But retroactive interference would be if you try to recall list one and the fact that it was sort of overwritten by window by mistake. So those are the, some of the kinds of ways in which it's studied in the lab. 
Often we forget, we, rem we forget an aspect of memory, in particular its source. We have a misattribution. And there are many different types of uh, variations on misattribution. We could have memory misattribution when information is correctly remembered but mistakenly associated with an incorrect source. So somebody told you a party was here when it was, when you think Joe told you a part of party when it was actually Jane. Okay. Um, you have source amnesia, which is sort of a, a variant on that, when information is correctly remembered but the source is not remembered at all. So in memory misattribution, you confuse the sources. In source amnesia, you forget the source. You know you have the party, but you don't know how. Uh, memory mi these are things that often happen also with aging. I remember we would ask my grandmother as she became old and a little demented, what happened today? And she would say, oh, there was a terrible murder, um, and then there was this shooting, and then so on and so forth. And what she was describing, of course she'd been home all day, what she was describing was what she'd seen on the TV. But she would sort of misattribute what she saw on TV and what she saw in real life. Okay? Cryptamnesia um, is something you should all be aware of um, because it's very relevant to the creative and original work that you'll all be doing as part of your thesis. It's mistakenly remembering someone else's ideas as one's own. Okay? You read a paper, you see something. At, at the moment, you may be recognizing it as coming in a paper or something else, but you then forget about it. And weeks later, something comes up, and you think, aha, I have this idea. And you don't remember that you've actually recalled it from something else. And therefore, you have a source amnesia, but it's a particular source amnesia whereby you forget the source is external and you think it's something you've generated on your own creatively. And one often sees, um, uh, particularly in music, where you know, a certain tonal sequence you know, that becomes very popular can often be, uh, have its roots in another song. And many often people have said that you know, such and such a Beatles song or such and such another famous song was really written by so and so 10 years earlier. And the question is, you know, when uh, John Lennon or somebody was sort of coming up with their new tune, you know, they think they're developing it themselves, but could they have actually heard this song back of their head and then sort of forget that they'd actually heard it on the radio and begin to think they generated it? So false memory is where we actually can be led to believe something that doesn't actually occur. Beth Loftus is, is the person who's done um, a lot of the studies in this area. This has a lot of implications for eyewitness testimony. Okay? As you may have noticed, when now that DNA testing has become common, lots of eyewitness testimony that seemed so compelling because people were so sure of what they described, now we know had to have been false. And yet it's so compelling when you hear someone be so certain about something. Um, and it's only now that DNA, and psychologists for years have been telling the courts, you know, eyewitness testimony isn't nearly as useful as you imagine. It can be created, it can be manufactured, it can be sort of biased in various ways. But now that DNA testing has come out and shown that, in fact, many people's who were convicted based on eyewitness testimony are in fact innocent, it's created a whole new look at some of the susceptibility of eyewitness testimony. So one of the ways in which Beth Lofta studied this, this is sort of, um, she had, she worked with people and their families. She said they were going to do a study of autobiographical memory. They were collected photos from someone's families. And they would surreptitiously talk to the family, the parents say, and say, you know, did little Johnny ever go up in a balloon ride? And the parents would assure them that Johnny never had gone up in the balloon ride and then with, with the father. And then what they would do is they would Photoshop, this is actually probably before Photoshop, it was probably cutting and pasting. Um, they would take a picture of this person and their father and they would paste it into a picture of a hot air balloon ride like this. So they would create this false image and they would put it in the midst of a pile of lots and lots of other photos that were actually true and real. And the, in the experiment, the study of autobiographical memory, they would go through each of these pictures and ask people to uh, tell them what they recalled about it. So how many people do you think could be convinced that, uh, that they had been on a balloon ride based on that technique? Do you think you, do you, think you could be convinced? I see. I see. Okay. Well, in fact, quite a lot of people, in fact, not only did people, by and large, uh, you know, uh, say that yes, they remembered it. Maybe not the first time, because they would go through these things over and over again. Um, but by that last time they had gone through the whole list of photos, people were not only saying they remembered it, they were remembering where it was, they were remembering that they had cotton candy, that they threw up afterwards. Not only did they remember it, but they created, began to sort of elaborate it with ever more details as they were asked about it over and over again. So again, we saw, even though this was clearly a false memory, if you keep asking people about it and they begin to believe that they actually did it, they begin not only to say, yes, I remember it, but they add all sorts of details that aren't even in the photo. 
One, one thing we know about memory is it, it doesn't work like a videotape recorder. You, you don't just record the event and play it back later. But rather, it's malleable and it's susceptible to distortion, contamination, and other influences. She asked me to study these faces. Then, after a few minutes, she gave me a memory test. Which of these two faces do you recognize from the original study phase? Right. Okay, you picked right. Left. You picked left. Okay. And I said left, but I wasn't 100% sure. And then, the tricky part. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why I'm stymied. Because I just picked this one on the left two seconds ago. But now I'm not sure. Because those two look very much alike to me. But I'm going to tell you the left. But I was wrong. It was the one on the right. And that's the whole point of the study. Loftus explained how, like her study subjects, I had been duped. You saw this face. Then I gave you a test where I presented you with an <gasps> altered face. Oh my God. Along with a novel one. So I pretty much induce you to pick a wrong face <gasps> because I don't even have the real guy there. It's an altered version. Yeah. And later on, when you now yeah. have a choice between the altered one and the real one, yeah. You stuck with your altered left yeah. choice. She says the more recent memory contaminates the original. Get the light back. So another way in which false memory can be induced in the laboratory without doing all this cutting and pasting or photoshopping is the following. And I don't know if we talked about this earlier this week, um, maybe not. So participants have shown a list of words that are all related to a specific topic, but the topic itself is not on the list. Did we do this on Tuesday? Okay, well, okay. Such as wet, umbrella, puddle, mud, clouds, fog, falling drops, galoshes, they're sort of a theme, a theme. But rain is not included. Rain is sort of a theme word that relates to all of them, but it's not included. Later tested, most participants remember the admitted word. When we asked them, you know, was this word on it or not? If you ask them rain, they'll say, yes, rain was part of that list. So people sort of fill in the gaps and make an inference about a word that's missing. And they're often very, very confident of it. And scariest of all, people report very specific details. So people will remember, even if, if you have them, uh, uh, the w different words read in male or female voices, people will remember, even have a very specific memory of the voice in which they heard that word, when obviously that couldn't have happened. So, here, this is actually sugar and sw sweet is the theme word here. Um, percent recognition. Um, theme words are recognized almost as common as the correct ones, and sort of novel words are not. Okay. One of the things actually quite interesting about this is this has become a paradigm for studying individual differences and in susceptibility to false memories. You know, so, and they're very, in, in this case, the intrusions are very, very high. There are other variants in this task where, on average, it's sort of a little lower, and so you can you can look across individuals and say, across two groups of people, are they more or less susceptible to these sorts of intrusions? And one of the more provocative studies was done at Harvard. There was, uh, about 20 years ago, there was a whole uh, uh, flurry of what were called sort of uh, recovered memories of childhood sex sexual abuse. So people who, in their adult years, were generally seeing a therapist or a hypnotist and trying to understand some reason why they were having trouble with relationships or life, and through therapy or hypnosis, they would believe that they had recovered a childhood memory of abuse by a parent, a relative, a teacher. And through this therapy and hypnosis, they would become absolutely convinced that this had happened, that it had been suppressed for many years as a very sort of Freudian-like interpretation. You know, this must have been so traumatic, I repressed it. But now, through the benefits of, of psychotherapy and hypnosis, I've recovered it. And now I know why I'm having trouble with intimacy and so on and so forth. You know, it was my teacher who raped me or my parents or so forth, and they accused them. Families were broken up. It was very controversial. And uh, what uh, uh, Dan, uh, Dan Schachter and a colleague at Harvard did is they took a number of people who were, you know, had claimed to have had these recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse and compared them to a controlled group of people who'd also been sexually abused as children, or, but there had never been, there had never been any doubt of it. You know, it was always documented, they'd always been aware of it all of their life, so it wasn't a, um, a, a repressed memory. And they compared them and what they found was that 
the people, although one never knows what actually happened with any individual, whether they were abused or not, um, the group that had this recovered memory showed many higher, you know, who claimed to have these recovered memories that had been repressed, had many, many higher intrusions of false words, suggesting that as a group, on average, these people are much more susceptible to source amnesia for a memory. And this was, as you might imagine, very controversial because these people got very upset because it suggested, of course, that perhaps these people are more liable to be confusing what they remembered in therapy or what was suggested by a therapist or so on and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about memory consolidation and reconsolidation. It's an area that's been very uh, a hot topic. Um, this is sort of the Ebbinghaus graph that we talked about earlier this week. Ebbinghaus was the first to observe this exponential forgetting curve. Um, it seems to show that initial storage is fragile. And um, the uh, consolidation is the name given to the process, a theoretical process, we don't really always know how it works, which strengthens stored information so that it doesn't decay or protects against decay. One of the ways in which memory consolidation has been studied is in patients who get electroconvulsive therapy. So um, what they often find is that if you give somebody electroconvulsive therapy, you get a limited duration of retrograde amnesia, okay? So that if you look at what they, uh, what this is sort of time since, oh, this is actually, um, this is, I guess, back to this issue of those episodes. Remember I talked about those episodes that people forget? Well, it turns out if people have, have uh, ECT, they actually can forget TV shows um, that after ECT, they can often have, have a great decline in things that happened in the last year or so, okay? But no effect on things that happened many years in the past. So you often see this, so this is actually a, a, an example of, of this ECT interfering with recent memories, but not very recent memories, but not longer memories, suggesting that whatever ECT is doing, it's interfering with the process um, that of w by which memories, and this, these memories are still labile, while these ones are more resistant. You often see this in uh, car accidents at a shorter time frame. People will be in a car accident, and they will forget not only the accident, they'll forget, for example, the evening up until the, the party in which they left. And so the idea is that somehow the trauma of an accident can actually cause people to lose several hours uh, of events that happened just prior to the trauma, suggesting that although normally if you would ask them what happened an hour ago, what happened two hours ago, they would know it all, due to some trauma like ECT or a car accident, these memories that are in a sort of a labile, vulnerable state can be disrupted and lost. So let's try to apply what we know. What are some of the best study habits? So how could you take advantage of each of these following memory principles to better your own study. You want to take prior knowledge? So how could you take advantage of prior knowledge to improve your study? You know, what we know about the role of prior knowledge in facilitating encoding. How could you use that? This is sort of applying what you know to, to doing better in foundations. So what? All right, getting a little bit of background context. Um, one of the reasons why, for example, we rarely take people right out of college into the graduate program. We much prefer that people, for example, have worked in a lab for a year or two, because if we sit there and talk about all these facts about the brain and all this, this and so forth, um, if you've actually worked, like I know some, many of you have, in a lab for a year or two where you've been there, you've seen research, you've been in the animals, you've been helping out, you have a sort of a broad hands-on feel for a lot of things that are going on so that when you get this information, you have a sort of a structure of experiences, of, of individual episodic experiences in a laboratory so that this, this semantic knowledge, because pretty much everything you get in these lectures is semantic information, it's knowledge that we're passing on. You may remember having come to the lecture, but really what's important here is, is the semantic knowledge. And that semantic knowledge, if it can be tied on to either prior semantic knowledge or even better prior episodic knowledge, your experiences in a lab. It's also why business schools, for example, which talk about business theory, never take anyone right out of college. They'll often admit you. You know, Harvard Business School will say, you know, congratulations, you've been admitted to the class of 2016. Go out and work in industry for two years and then come back. Okay, the same reason. How about depth of processing? What would be a way in which you could use depth of processing to improve your comprehension and grade and foundations? That's great. I love it. Okay. 
Like take all the different neurotransmitters, make up a song about all the neurotransmitters? That's great. Any other ones? Nobody else can, can anyone, I don't, no one can come up with a more creative answer. Can anybody else come up with another answer? Serotonin, dopamine, da, 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 right? <laughs> norepinephrine, norepinephrine, no. So, any other ideas how, how you could, uh, how you could use depth of processing? Yeah, right, but if, now this question of just how, de after all, if you can sing the neurotransmitters, if you can have mnemonics, um, but how deep is that? You know, again, is that after all, remember that just pronouncing a word is sort of the example of low processing while imaging it. So perhaps another approach would be to sort of draw, you know, taking, re taking your notes, okay, you all, of course, will make available all the PowerPoint slides because that's nice and that's convenient. Um, there's actually an advantage to taking notes the old-fashioned way, you know, of listening and writing things down because as you process it, as you put it into your own words, as you write it down, that's a depth of processing that's much more than sort of reviewing the slides. So, although we'll make the, although we'll make the slides available, um, actually taking the slides, putting them into your own words, writing your own notes is actually extraordinarily useful. Okay. Transfer appropriate processing. Well, we said you can all come in here and study. Um, any other thoughts on transfer appropriate processing? Maybe. What? <laughs> okay. So, let's apply what we know. Suppose you're a police detective and you need to interview several eyewitnesses to a crime. How might, how might you take what we've learned so far and apply it to minimize false memories? Yeah, don't think any, any, any other thoughts? How could we take what we've learned here? So you want to do it as quickly as possible. Any other, uh, any other thoughts? So there's actually been a lot of change in the way eyewitness testimony was done. So it used to be, I mean of course, you know, if somebody was, you, you want to get the people to be as similar as possible, so usually the same, it's approximately the same age and race, you know, of the person. Um, so, and you generally want them to have remove their hats and, and other things that would distinguish them or obscure them. But the traditional way of doing an eyewitness lineup was to get six guys and say, what? To line them up. You know, that's the traditional, just like the image I showed a minute ago, you know, your, your classic image in the movies, there are all these guys lined up, they've got the little, like, height bars behind them, and the and you, know, you bring the witness in from behind a glass or something, and she has to point out, oh, it was the third guy from the left you know, who, who robbed me or attacked me. Um, and the problem with that is that there's a tremendous amount of uh, expectation on the person that one of these is the correct person, okay? So that you're sort of biased to assume that you have to pick somebody, and so maybe you pick the person who looks most like it. And you keep looking at them and looking at them, and, and so forth. it can be almost like you know, almost like the situation of the kid. If you're told, just like if you're told that all these pictures here are really from your childhood, then you start by sort of assuming that um, and can begin to elaborate it. If you're told that one of these six guys is the guy who attacked you and you focus on the one who looks most similar, you might begin to look at him and look at him and look at him and eventually in your mind you can actually almost recreate a memory that has that person even if it wasn't that person. So one of the things that they do now is they no longer do a lineup that has a forced choice because that, that contains the, the implicit assumption that one of these is the person who did it. But they bring people in one at a time, okay? And so you never quite know how many people there are going to be. Um, and therefore you're not sort of in a situation where you will assume that one of these people is it. Okay, so that's just one, one of the ways. So let me give a brief summary. Um, the case of HM shows that memory reflects the operation of multiple brain systems. Working memory, what you're currently attending to. Long-term memory, which is divided into declarative or explicit memory and non-declarative memory. Declarative memory can be further broken down into episodic and semantic. Mm -hmm. And there are three major processes for memory, the encoding, the consolidation, and the retrieval. Errors can occur in, in any of them. Enco encoding is the initial storage of information in memory. It takes more than repetition and it works best with deep processing and background knowledge. 
Retrieval works best if the recall conditions match the learning conditions. We call that transfer appropriate processing. And if more cues are available. Okay. Memory can fail for many reasons, including simple forgetting, which often happens rapidly at first and then more slowly. Interference can be both proactive, where previous knowledge interferes with acquiring new knowledge, and retroactive, where new knowledge wipes out previous knowledge. Misattribution, losing the connection between memory and source. And false memory, where you can be incorrectly remember information, which is surprisingly easy to do as memories are highly malleable. And memories are not just passively stored, but are consolidated and strengthened over time, and brain injury can disrupt this consolidation process. Okay. So I'm going to stop there. Can you hit the kill button? Okay. So we'll talk now about the brain substrates of episodic and semantic memory. I'm starting to we'll go cover the cerebral cortex, the medial temporal lobes, the frontal cortex, and some of the subcortical structures. Semantic memories seem to be distributed throughout the cerebral cortex, uh, where in which one has sensory cortex, which is for the first cortical processing for sense, and the association cortex linking memories, so that a specific memory does not exist so much in a semantic memory in a particular cell or location, but is all very often distributed across a variety of sensory and association modalities. Um, cortical stimulation can often evoke both simple sensations as well as complex memories. People with cortical lesions display different types of agnosia, that is selective semantic memory impairments. There's auditory agnosia for speech, where you can't understand spoken words, although other sounds are recognized, and even tactile agnosia, uh, where you can't recognize objects by feel. There's also something called prospagnosia, where you can't recognize faces. So depending on, on stroke damage and so forth, you can often get very selective damage to specific aspects of semantic memories. Um, you can even get uh, cells that respond to Steve Carroll, but not to other actors. Um, but of course, how one interprets that one doesn't really think that there's a part of the brain associated with Steve Carroll, and yet it's clear that one can sort of do recordings that actually can differentiate um, what it is that you're looking at versus other pictures. So taken together, the evidence suggests that semantic memories are stored across many specialized areas in the cortex. So for example, your semantic memory of an apple uh, might include visual components and visual cortex, olfactory components in the olfactory lobe, and associations with other fruits in association cortex. So it's the global pattern of activations, which is what we, what is, we believe to be the encapsulation of our semantic memory for Apple and all that we know about apples. The medial temporal lobes, this is sort of the part of the brain that HM had removed. Um, how do declarative memories get stored and consolidated in the cortex? Remember we talked about the medial temporal lobe as being critical for going from working memory, from sort of our active conscious memory to long-term memory, a critical is the consolidation process. The hippocamp, the medial temporal lobe includes the hippocampus and the surrounding uh, entorhinal, perirhinal, and parahippocampal regions. I know, I, am, I, know I know who I am, I know all about myself. I just, since my injury, I can't make new memories. Everything fades. If we talk for too long, I'll forget how we started, and next time I see you, I'm not going to remember this conversation. <laughs> I don't even know if I've met you before. Um, amnesia comes up in movies a lot. It's a good sort of plot device. This is actually one of the few movies, Memento, in which the amnesia portrayed was actually very much like the kind of anterior grade amnesia you see with hippocampal damage. We showed, uh, on Tuesday, I showed something about the life of HM, right? That little video clip about him and his wife and his constantly sort of feel like he was just waking up, that he hadn't been conscious and, and he was just waking up and, and was going over and over again. So we're going to come back to another clip from the same documentary, but that talks a little bit about HM's brain. It is of interest that he has retained the musical abilities that he has. Some musical abilities may be more dependent on uh, right uh, temporal function. Also notice the extensive enlargement of the ventricular system. These are the anterior horns of the lateral ventricle. Here's the size that they should appear. This very small area is a more normal uh, size of the, this part of the lateral ventricles. The enlargement is associated with a massive loss of brain substance spread throughout the brain, not just the uh, 
temporal and inferior frontal damage, but there's been some generalized loss of tissue. You can see that also when you look at a lateral view of the brain. Here is a normal lateral view or sagittal cut, and this structure right at midline is called the corpus callosum. And that's what a healthy corpus callosum looks like. This structure that wraps around right here, this is the fornix. And the fornix is a critical structure for the projection of uh, memory uh, information from the hippocampus. When we look here in Clive, we see that the corpus callosum is smaller in size, and there's only a little remnant of the fornix left. And that is because there is massive damage to the hippocampus, essentially complete wasting of the hippocampus on the left and almost complete wasting of the hippocampus on the right. Another view that we can look at to examine the type of damage present in this patient is the axial view. And this is taken in the horizontal plane where we cut across like this and we're looking at the inferior part of the frontal lobe. And in this view right here, uh, we have made that section. This is a normal subject and pay particular attention to this region here and this is the mesial part of the temporal lobe where all of the damage has occurred in Clive. The infection process spreads in this region and if we now look at his scan we can see the extensive damage on the left as I mentioned. See this is the left side of the brain here. Extensive damage to the mesial part of the right and then here is the inferior frontal damage in this uh, patient. That's at the posterior part of the inferior frontal region. Now this particular region of the brain is important in regulatory aspects of behavior. And some of the discontrol that this patient has, especially the emotional lability and changes that occur, are undoubtedly related to the damage at the temporal lobe level, but also this involvement at the inferior frontal region of the brain. What I'd like to do now is also show these various two-dimensional images now in three-dimensional space. And we can do that by taking each plane and putting it in the proper position with the other planes. And this is seen in this three-dimensional lattice work type array that is on the computer monitor now. And so these vertical lines here, they represent the coronal sections that have been cut across like this. These horizontal lines here represent the axial views that have been cut across like so. And then we also have the mid-sagittal view that's right at midline here. And see, there's the nose and there's the mouth. And now we're going to rotate this and see, we'll rotate the head. You can see the ears out here. There's the nose and uh, here are the ears. Now we can cut back. And so we'll now cut back and expose the damage. And what we've done here is we've colorized the damage in uh, red to show how extensive wasting has occurred in the temporal lobe region. And now we can rotate this image. And you'll see the extensive amount of pathology that is present. Again, the greatest amount of loss of tissue is on the left side in the left temporal region but the damage is obviously bilaterally represented, as you can see here. And as we turn this around and look uh, towards the back, again, this dark area here, that represents the wasting of the brain in the temporal lobe region. As we tilt the scan back, you can also see where the damage is in the inferior frontal region of the brain. And it's the combination of this inferior frontal damage and the bilateral temporal lobe damage that then represents the deficits that we see in this patient that are primarily manifested as a profound loss of any short-term memory and the emotional liability and discontrol evident. I think when most people uh, come across Clive for the first time or if they would read his his neuropsychological test scores, um, if they would look at his case history, they would assume that uh, he has a virtually total loss of short-term memory 
and because he is, uh, he has to live looked after 24 hours a day, they would assume that there's nothing much left of him inside. In fact, there's a lot left of him inside. Uh, there's a lot going on in there which tests are not sensitive to. Um, he remains a very intelligent and lucid and articulate person. And the deficits he has are very specific and they don't uh, affect him in a general way. They affect particular kinds of memory function. Therefore, although he has no conscious memory um, of anything that's happened since he was ill, he has no episodic memory for the whole of his life. In any amount of testing, he's never managed to produce a single episodic memory. And in, in all my, his exposure to me, I've never witnessed any, any episodic memory. Nevertheless, he retains an intelligent semantic memory about his life. He knows that he worked for the BBC. He knows that he was a conductor. He knows that he's married to me. He knows that he has children from a prior marriage. Um, he just doesn't know the details and he can't bring those things to mind. Now the interesting thing is that even though um, on a minute to minute basis he is forgetting everything that happens. He, he perceives the world around him as you or I would, but uh, everything is erased immediately afterwards. And so moment to moment, he forgets exactly what's just happened. But he does show uh, signs of implicit learning. For example, when he's been watching a video, the same video every day, he now anticipates what is going to happen on the video, although he has no conscious recollection of ever having seen the video before. In other words, learning is going on at a procedural level, at an implicit level, at a non-declarative level, and he, it is not open to his conscious inspection. He can't, um, if asked, do you know anything about it? No, 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 never seen it before in my life. But it's there and he can use it, and that's what's helping him now, 13 years post-injury. It's helping him to function as uh, an articulate and communicative human being. Uh, as a companion, we have very meaningful conversations, whereas for the first seven years, we had three short loop take conversations verbatim, repeated verbatim with the same inflections, the same intonation, the same expressions on his face, uh, so much so that after having the same conversation for seven years, I couldn't hear what he was saying any longer. Now I can phone him up and say, do you know what happened at work today? And I can have a very uh, ordinary conversation and he responds, he listens, he follows the train of thought and he gives me really good advice. So this is just back here. Let's look at each of these lesions of the medial temple. Oh, can we put it back on? Sorry. Um, the, oh, the camera's still on, right, yeah. Um, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so lesions of the medial temporal lobe produce anterior grade amnesia, that's memory lo loss of new, new memories, an inability to consolidate declarative memories, hippocampus activity during learning. So that's some of the evidence of these lesion studies, like Clive Wearing and HM. Other data that I'll get to is from functional brain imaging, where hippocampal activity during learning if it predicts subsequent ability to remember. So the idea is that the more hippocampal activity you see at specific events, the more likely you are to remember those events. So let's take a look at each of these in turn. So here's another patient. We we've seen, of course, Clive Wearing. Patient EP had bilateral damage to the medial temporal lobe, similar to HM, similar to Clive Wearing. He can directly copy a figure. So if you show him a figure and it's up there, he can copy it. So he has the ability to do it. But he can't draw a figure from memory. So here, cop, cop if EP is looking at the figure, he can copy it quite well. After a short delay, he just is completely lost. He has no, no ability to remember those details. Um, similarly, animals with damage in the medial temporal lobe show an inability to form new declarative memory in the, in the radial arm maze and so forth. Um, another bit of evidence, there's some studies done in, in England, unlike in New York, where you can get off the boat and be given a cab license like that. In England, to get a uh, 
a taxi license, you have to do something called the knowledge. It's a, a multi-year apprenticeship of training and learning to show that you can actually navigate all throughout London and do it on a map with no na names and follow all. It's a very rigorous test. And what they found was that if they look at licensed London taxi drivers um, versus normal controls, uh, match controls, that uh, there's much larger posterior hippocampus in the taxi drivers. Now, that, that this, this data doesn't answer the cause or effect. Is that because seven years of studying navigation in London increases your hippocampus, or is that the only people who pass the test are those who have a big hippocampus and up to begin with, because many people don't pass it? Um, uh, one of the studies that used functional brain imaging had the following paradigm. Participants scanned while learning a list of words. They're later tested on words. And then we go back and compare brain activity for the words that were remembered versus words that were later forgotten. And what it showed is that brain activity required to properly encode uh, and consolidate semantic memories, um, the hippocampal area of the temporal lobes, and also the left frontal cortex. So it suggests that for the best memory for items occurs, if your left frontal cortex and your hippocampus are active during the event. Depth of processing, remember the studies we talked before about where you could either pronounce words or image them. Um, imaging, um, so bilateral, so de deeper processing involves more medial temporal activity, better encoding. More medial temporal activity during learning predicts not only the ability to recall, but the ability to remember source information. In that related word paradigm that we talked about, the hippocampus is often fooled by the, lore, by the lore word, that is the word that is related but not presented. Okay? But one region of the medial temporal lobe, however, seems to be only activated by actual words seen, um, suggesting that it might be possible, and this is also very preliminary, to actually sort of use brain imaging to try to tease apart false from accurate memories. So taking together this evidence that the medial temporal lobe, especially the hippocampus, consolidates declarative memories, there's a, an ongoing controversy into how it works. There are two theories that could be called the standard consolidation theory and the multiple memory trace theory. Um, the standard consolidation theory says that during learning, the medial temporal lobe relays information to cortex. Over time, the cortex gets the message and the memories become independent of the medial temporal lobe. That's, of course, suggested by studies from HM um, in which you can remove the hippocampus, medial temporal lobe, and still have these memories intact. Um, so this is the sort of the HM and the Cly-Wearing data. Um, more recently, some people have been arguing that for, me for many sorts of memories, the medial temporal lobe helps organize the distributed semantic facts into specific episodic memories, and that true ep episodic memories are never fully independent of the medial temporal lobe. Okay? So this would suggest that even in someone like EP or HM or Cly-Wearing, if you're losing the hippocampus, you may, still be, you, you, you may still have semantic knowledge, but that episodic memories uh, may be gone forever. Um, and of course, part of the problem there is it's often hard to know from when we look back at someone like Clive Wearing. So th this would suggest that, in fact, Clive Wearing, of course, no, he can't form any new episodic or semantic memories, but it would suggest that everything he knows past is semantic, not episodic. And part of the problem is very often you know, you feel like you have an episodic memory, but it's just because your parents have told you over and over again about the time that you went to Disneyland, and so it's become almost a semantic knowledge. I went to Disneyland when I was six, um, versus your actual memories of the event. Okay. So let me talk a bit about the frontal cortex. So the frontal cortex may play a role in organizing in declarative memories, selecting what's to be encoded in long-term memory, and then retrieving memory back into working memory. This may be why it's not enough just to have an active hippocampus, but you need to have an active frontal lobe to encode information in a list learning paradigm. Frontal lobe damage causes problems with source memory, suggesting problems of retrieving complex memories, okay? Suggesting perhaps that people who have some frontal damage may be most susceptible to these kinds of false memories and source attribution. Frontal lobe seems to be controlling the hippocampus, possibly guiding the consolidation process. Um, during learning, some regions of the frontal lobe predict increased medial temporal lobe activity. Directed forgetting is a paradigm where you're actually told, forget this, remember that, okay? And uh, this, these sort of studies have been used, I'm not going to go into them in detail, I think I actually want to skip over them mostly, 
suggests the frontal cortex can manage the medial temporal lobe. So one way to think about the frontal lobe is that it's sort of coordinating the processes of what's remembered and what's forgotten. Let me just briefly note some critical subcortical structures. Two additional structures play a role in regulating episodic and semantic memory, the diencephalon and the basal forebrain. If any of you have ever had any lectures from Laszlo Zaborski, you've heard lots about the basal forebrain. Damage to either can cause anterior grade amnesia. So in addition to getting amnesia from uh, damage, direct damage to the hippocampus, you can also have damage due to damage to either of these two structures. The medial temporal lobe is regulated by the basal forebrain, as Laszlo will tell you. Structures at the base of the forebrain, the medial septum releases acetylcholine and GABA into the hippocampus. If you damage the basal forebrain, you damage the functionality of the hippocampus, even the physical hippocampus. You can get strokes in the basal forebrain that can result in amnesia. Um, and uh, one of the most common is what are called a ACOA, or uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysms, can damage the basal forebrain and cause amnesia. And survivors, in addition to having amnesia, will often confabulate. They'll often confuse free associations with reality, suggesting that they may also have disruptions to the frontal lobe. Okay. The diencephalon includes the mammillary bodies and the medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus. These can be damaged in Korsakoff's disease, which you see very often in patients with thiamine deficiency, um, which very often occurs in chronic alcohol abuse. So part of the problem in studies is that people who are chronic alcoholics usually have more than just a thiamine deficiency. They often have lots of other problems. Um, in my lab, we've done some studies of Korsakoff's disease that came not from alcoholism, but from Turkish prisoners, political prisoners, who went on a hunger strike, and unlike in the United States, where if someone goes on a hunger strike at a certain point, they put them on IV forcibly. In Turkey, they just let themselves starve themselves to near death. And as a result, these people had a vitamin deficiency in the absence of alcoholism. And so we've done some amnesia studies there. Okay. So an interim summary, declarative memories, both episodic and semantic, depend on the integrated activity of several specialized brain regions. The frontal cortex is critical for selecting information for future processing. The medial temporal lobe, especially the hippocampus, is critical for consolidating this information for storage and distribution across the cortex. The cerebral cortex will store declarative memories distributed across many different specialized regions. And there's some additional modulatory roles from the basal forebrain and the diencephalon. The role of the medial temporal lobe is still being debated. There's a standard consolidation theory which suggests that the hippocampus becomes irrelevant after the memories are stored. Um, there's a, a more recent suggestion that this may be true um, only for semantic memories, but episodic memories may actually require the hippocampus. And our understanding of declarative memory comes both from humans as well as attempts to develop animal models of these processes. Okay. So let me talk just a little bit about some clinical perspectives. We've seen talking about patients like Clive Wearing and HM and EP. We've already seen that aspect of the ways in which clinical studies have informed uh, our understanding of declarative memory. We'll talk primarily about transient global amnesia and functional amnesia. I can't remember anything that happened before two weeks ago. Amnesia? Yes. Is it to find out who he is? I guess you're not home. Monsieur Bond. I don't recognize any of this. I don't recognize any of this. Before they find out. Okay, so this was an example from the movies very often you don't see anterior grade amnesia except in, in uh, Memento. Uh, more common is, is a theatrical device, in, in a plot device, is, is retrograde amnesia where you've lost everything in the back. So born completely present, he can have a conversation, he knows what's just happening, but he doesn't know who he is, he doesn't know anything that happened up until recently. Okay? That is not something you see very often. Um, what you see more often is the anterior grade amnesia in patients like HM and Clive Wearing. You'll often see temporary global amnesia in which there's a, a brief interruption of blood flow to the brain, often by a head injury or low blood sugar. Um, and uh, these imaging studies suggest there's sort of transient abnormalities in the hippocampus. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this here. The kind of amnesia that was shown in the movies uh, very often is what's often what's called a functional or psychogenic amnesia. This is often not from brain damage. Um, but uh, can be a loss of identity from some severe psychological trauma. So the kinds of, uh, it's also something which can be often be faked, you know, for personal gain. 
you know, you're, you're off. People often claim they don't remember what happened for the last week or so, um, you know, because in fact they've been with their mistress in Florida or something like that, or they're trying to uh, uh, pretend that they weren't aware of something. So it occurs. It's it's off. It can often be faked, or it can be sort of from some more psychological trauma. Uh, one case was of a, a lumberjack called P.N. who had severe retrograde amnesia, but intact language skills, very much like Bourne. One week after the onset, a movie funeral on, trig on TV triggered his recovery. So it only lasted for a week, where he was just completely sort of lost. And it was suggested that extreme grief from his grandfather's death may have precipitated this fugue state. So no, no traumatic imaging. Um, and a PET scan found decreased glucose in the medial temporal lobe and diencephalon in this patient. So anyway, we don't really understand functional amnesia other than to suggest that it's not often the cause of any specific brain damage. So that brings me to the end of the scientific part of the lecture. One of the things people always ask is, so if you're a memory expert, how can, you, how can I help improve my memory? So what I want to do now as a postscript is sort of pull back together some of uh, what we've learned here, um, a little bit of what we talked about earlier in this week, and try to give you some news you can use, the ways in which you can uh, develop not so much tricks to some degree, but also uh, lifestyle changes to improve your memory. So memory, what you can do to improve yours. So one thing is to create, interesting how the color here has no relationship to the color on mine. Uh, so a whole bunch of memory tips. Make associations with what you already know. Okay, this is about this, we talked a bit about the science of that, with that sort of balloon story. So for example, if you have to learn that silver equals AG, if this was in a chemistry class, um, you might know, for example, that argent is Latin for silver. That's, a, that's one of the examples where background knowledge can be helpful. And Argentina was actually named by Europeans who thought the region rich in silver. So the degree to which you have you know, a broad knowledge uh, of history and, and, and other languages allows you to remember something which to anybody else would be a, a random association. So again, as I mentioned, for older people, the more information, the more well that you have, the more you can begin to sort of develop uh, memory associations. Another type, another memory tip is to use visual associations, a picture. Uh, a, a visual picture is much better than words. So often a way to remember is to link names or facts to a vivid image. So if you're in an art class and you need to remember that Manet painted human figures, but Monet painted water lilies, you could easily imagine confusing it. Many people do, Manet and Monet. You could imagine an A, visualize an A made up of lots of little people, and an O made up of lots of little painted water lilies. And if you keep this visual image in your mind, then when it's, which is Manet painted, which is Monet, they did the words differ by a letter, you have this image of that letter, that, that both a visual image and something that's a little bit unusual and unique, perhaps even slightly absurd, becomes more memorable. I would beware the limits of memory, tip number two. We've seen throughout uh, this lecture lots of examples where people's memories are malleable, people convicted of murder are often based on completely erroneous eyewitness testimony. Most people overestimate their memory. So when people tell you, tells you, you know, how sure they are of something that they saw or heard, you want to be a little bit skeptical. Practice, 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 particularly when it comes to skill memory. Firemen do it, they drill and drill so they don't have to think. Pianists do it they, hours a day. So all these sorts of non-declarative memories, there's an enormous amount of practice. They've been estimated that someone like Tiger Woods, before he won his first championship, had spent 10,000 hours practicing golf. So it's not just innate talent, which obviously someone like Tiger Wood has, but an incredible amount of focus and dedication to practice and practice. Sleep more at night, taking naps. One of the things my lab is focusing on now is sleep research. Um, but there's a broad range of research suggesting that cognitive function and memory critically depends on sleep. Um, and not only sleep at night, but sleep during the day can be helpful. Um, stress is really bad. So when you start to stress, when you get caught in traffic, or when you get bad news on the phone, um, you want to think about, uh, remember from Star Trek, that they talk about the dilithium crystals are going to blow up if you try to uh, use it. Well, think about your hippocampal neurons are like these critical dilithium crystals in, in Star Trek, that they'll blow up. You know, if you push them too hard, they'll cause the brain to blow up. So 
what you want to do is relax, whether it's meditation or, or distraction or uh, whatever you do, relaxing is really critical for memory because if you get too stressed out, you not only directly interfere with memory, but you interfere with sleep. Um, write more things down. As the elephant says, as I get older, I rely more and more on these sticky notes to remind me, even an elephant. So if you're sitting there sweating about all the things you can't remember, one alternative is to sort of uh, need to remember less. Write more things down. Get regular aerobic exercise. There's an extraordinary amount of data that suggests that exercise has multiple pathways for influencing uh, brain function and memory. Um, in and one of the reasons it's one of the most effective ways to improve memory is that it doesn't just rely on one mechanism. It relies on all sorts of, of systems in the brain. And I'm happy to talk to people another time about that if you're interested. Um, staying mentally active, um, whether it's playing Sudoku or learning the drums or going to lectures, um, the more that you engage your mind, the more it stays active. The alternative is to lose it. Studies have shown that for each additional hour of TV watch per week by an adult, your risk for Alzheimer's increases by 30%. So one possibility is that, is that the boob tube really does rot your brain, as mom said. The other is that for every hour that you're watching TV, that's an hour that you're not being mentally engaged um, or physically active. So, okay. Um, so the other thing you can do is I just gave you eight tips. Do you remember them all? Sleep. Sleep. Um, exercise. I can see. Associations. Associations. Okay. So it's really hard to remember all eight if you've got memory problems. Okay. That's sort of the, that's a bit of the, 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 the irony here. So people often say, isn't there just one thing that you could do instead which would take care of all this memory advice about sleep and relaxation and exercise and so forth? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment to end the lecture. This is a memory improvement homework exercise. Um, this is the official Rutgers-Newark method for memory enhancement and Alzheimer's prevention. It is uh, endorsed by the co-directors of the Neuroscience Center. And what you want to do is go home tonight and have frequent vigorous sex with an intelligent partner. This is your homework assignment. The vigorous aspect will be exercise. The sex will reduce stress. If there's a partner, you're socializing and interacting. If they're intelligent, you're being mentally active and then you'll sleep better afterwards. So that's the final word on memory improvement and homework assignment. Okay, thank you. That's it. Want to turn that off?